Hey, what's up, guys? And welcome back again to UFC Roundup. I'm Paul Felder, and of course, of course, joined by Michael Chiesa. But first, before we get started on the amazing uh, giant pay-per-view event that we had recently, Michael, what happened to the Zags last night, man? Such mm. a heartbreaker, man. We had such a great season. That one's going to stink for a while, but I'm still proud of my boys. Zag up, Zag Nation. You know, the future is still bright for our team, but that one, that one hurt a little bit. You didn't burn anything down or break anything important in the house or, you know, do anything outlandish? Paul, this is Spokane, Washington. I don't live in Philly. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, not trying to, you're not trying to climb the greased telephone poles in, in the middle of the street? No, I just we just go home and pout. We don't destroy <laughs> the city. We just we try to build Boring. The, just build the city. <laughs> well, you know, uh, obviously we haven't had a chance to talk about it, but a title has changed hands and uh, in impressive fashion. Francis Ngannou is, of course, the new heavyweight champion, and he showed new facets to his game that we really knew had to be lined up for him to do what he did against Stipe, and that was so impressive to me. But what stood out the most to you amongst, you know, all of the things that he improved on? Well, the thing that stood out to me was the way he was able to pace himself and harness his power. I mean, this is a guy where everybody questioned the cardio from the first Steve Bay fight. And then his last fight before the title fight was the Rosen strike fight where he just kind of went out there and blitzed him. And it kind of left a lot of questions, but he answered those questions with flying colors. He passed, passed the test with flying colors really paced himself. He was able to harness his power. And that's what's going to make him very dangerous is how he's able to control himself through the duration of these fights. Definitely a very new and improved Francis Ngannou. Yeah. Yeah. I was talking to quite a few people uh, during the event and then, and obviously the week or so, a little more afterwards of just that, that how scary that is. That's terrifying. A Francis Ngannou who does not only go out there and have just brutal knockout power, but who can sit back and wait and time that shot. And then when you shoot on him, the more and more he can show off that wrestling defense and the sprawling ability, the way he circled to the back, if he can start showing even more and more of that grappling with his size and his strength, if he starts getting on top of these guys and doing even more damage with ground and pound, it's going to be a scary thing. But speaking of scary giant men, a man who has been at least talking about moving up to the heavyweight division is, of course, one of the greatest champions of all time to ever do it in the UFC, John Jones. But there's money talk out there, Michael. You know, we're fighters ourselves. We always want to get more and more, you know, for these events. But there's some crazy numbers being tossed around right now for John Jones. What do you think? Yeah, you know, I don't have any concrete facts. This is all stuff coming through of course. the media, yeah. through, different, through different channels. Um you know, initially I heard the first offer was eight to ten million, and that's a significant amount of money. But Jones, you know, Jones wants more. And uh, Coach Winkle John actually came out and said that they, they feel fifty million is is the fitting number for that fight. And it's hard to say. You know, I, I definitely think that this is a fight that is going to be worth paying. A, you know, a little above and beyond what what a yeah. standard title fight would be, considering what's at stake. I mean, Francis Ngannou versus John Jones. That could be the super fight that has eluded us for so long in the UFC. We've never got to see Habib and GSP. We never saw GSP and Anderson. We never saw Jones and Anderson. There were so many big super fights we never got to see. And potentially, this one could be bigger than all of them. So I think that they got to meet somewhere in the middle. But I, I think Jones, if Jones makes that jump up to fight Francis Ngano, I, th- I think he definitely deserves to be paid. Oh, no doubt. Right. And no doubt that he deserves to be paid. It's just at what point, uh, you know, and I'm sure a lot of the fans and what people are going to be arguing back and forth is, is he making the number so high that it's so outlandish that he knows he'll get all this attention and he won't get the fight? And I'm not saying that's what he's doing, but I, I see that that vibe is out there, that people are going to be like, oh, he's just making a number up that nobody's actually going to pay him. But I, I disagree. I think he's really trying to just push the envelope as far as he can. And like you said, Mike, somewhere in the middle is where it's going to fall. But He's been a champion. He's reigned for a really long time. He's had some setbacks, obviously, all due to himself personally. Uh, never really in his fighting career. Nothing he's done inside the cage, so outside of the cage. But uh, we'll see. I really do hope that fight gets done because you're right. That is one of those super fights. That My God, I mean, imagine tuning in. Imagine getting to work that event. We're sitting there possibly either up on the booth or, or right there, Cade side for John Jones and Francis Ngannou, two of the scariest dudes alive right now. Sign me up. I want that to happen. 
Yeah, I totally agree. I hope the fight happens, but it doesn't sound like the UFC wants to wait and play ball. I mean, they've already thrown out the Derek Lewis off. They offered Francis Ngannou, Derek Lewis, I think June 12th. And Francis, he decided he, he didn't want to take that fight. He wanted to take more time. Like, what are your thoughts on that, Paul? Do you think Francis should turn around and fight Derek Lewis immediately? Do you think he should wait and fight Derek Lewis? Do you think he's waiting to fight John Jones? Like, what are your thoughts on that situation? Yeah, well, I remember when, when, when I heard that news that that's what they were trying to book in June already. I, I, I even felt for Francis there. I was like, all right, whew, let him let him pull that belt out of the bag that it comes in first. Let him pick in his house where he's going to put it for a second. Let him go have dinner a hundred times with Eric Nixick and uh, go play soccer with some kids in the park. Because let's be honest, that's all Francis Ngannou really wants to do anyway, is go uh, go play some sports with, with kids and, and be a, a hilarious role model. Have you seen this guy around? He just wants to play soccer with kids. He is. He's, he's, so he's destined to be a good father someday. I yeah. Mean, it's definitely in his future. But I agree that he deserves to bask in this moment a little bit. I mean, he just yeah. won the heavyweight championship. The most heralded title in combat sports is being heavyweight champion. So he deserves his right to, to relax and enjoy his moment. He probably wants to go back home uh, to Cameroon and, and, and visit his family and, and go see his village and, and just let it be, let him enjoy this moment. Um, and we'll see what shakes out from there. I mean, I, I love the Derek Lewis fight, but I, I, I really want the John Jones fight. I mean, that's just, it's just the, the idea of that, just like you were saying, for us to potentially be there, yeah. the octagon side or up in the booth, just to be present for that moment, something that could, it could be the biggest fight in combat sports history. I mean, and, and I'm putting that up in the mix with Rumble in the Jungle and some of Ali's fights. I mean, that fight yeah. could be of that magnitude. So we'll see what happens yeah. with Francis Ngannou. Let me put you on the spot then. If you had to pick Mike, Stipe, Lewis, who's he going to fight? Jones, does it happen? If you had to say this next year, whatever this next fight is for Ngano, what will be his first title defense? What is your go-to if you had to put money on it? Who's he fighting? Jones. I mean, I, I'm so focused on that fight. I just, that fight could be so great. I know it's going to take a lot to get done, but I just – when you when you put me on the spot and say ready set go who yeah. is Francis right next I say Jones it's just my that's my knee jerk reaction so um, I'm going with Jones man I, I like it I like where your confidence is I mean because I, I that's the fight that's got to happen right there's been just enough talk and obviously there was this the talk with Israel as well but Izzy's got to go handle business at 185 the fight now Jones is officially really committed to moving up to heavyweight he said that i didn't put on all this weight for absolutely nothing i want to fight he's he's really made it clear that this isn't just a money you try to get as much money as possible and and really screw the ufc over he wants what he thinks he deserves to fight that man and um for both of us i hope it happens and i hope i get to work it yeah and that's that's some, some time down the road hopefully yeah. it gets announced but there has been a fight that's been announced recently Hmm. UFC 262, May 15th, co-main event, Nate Diaz versus Leon Edwards, the first five-round fight that's a non-main event, non-title fight in the co-main slot. What are your thoughts on that, Paul Felder? Okay. That fight, to me, did come out of absolutely nowhere, right? There was a lot of talks going around that Nate wanted to come back. Where is he going to fight 55-70? We all kind of knew that it was probably going to lead towards 170 because he's sick of cutting weight, and I don't blame him. Who cares about that? But for him to get somebody like Leon, I think it's great because it's an amazing fight, and Leon gets to really show the world himself against somebody who's got a big name. Diaz gets to prove that he belongs in the top and put himself in the title contention. There's lots of awesome things. We were talking about it yesterday. A lot of this, unfortunately, I'm stealing from you, Michael. But the, the, let me speak to the five rounds. This is where I really like it. I'm okay with more of these five-round fights. If there's a competitive matchup that fans want to see and it can't be for a belt, it can't be the main event on a pay-per-view card, let's start having some of these co-mains. Why can't these guys go five rounds? I want to see more of that. The people at the very tippy top of these divisions when they're fighting each other, these guys are close and these girls are close to title fights anyway. Let's get some more practice. It makes things more enticing, more exciting. And plus, if there's five rounds, fighters are probably getting extra bump in their pay. It's good for everybody. Yeah, coming from the iron lung, the man that's built to go five rounds, of course you love it. 
if there's more five round fights in the UFC. Uh, you know, and I think that that's something. I don't think that that's something the UFC came up with. I think that that was Nate Diaz saying, "Look, Nate's a guy that if he comes back, there's going to be some things that are going to be on his terms." And I think that for him to come back, he wants to fight five rounds. I mean, he's a cardio based fighter. He gets better as the fights go on. And I think that that's something that he wanted. And I think that there's a lot of fun things you can do. I mean, as a fan, as a spectator, I love the fight. I think that, you know, if Nate wins and let's say hypothetically Hori Masvidal beats Kamaru Usman, then you get the BMF rematch for the welterweight title. So you almost have like two belts on the line. And, it, you know, and if Nate wins, it, it puts him in the mix. He's a superstar in the UFC. They want guys like Nate Diaz to be a champion or to be contending for titles because he pulls such big numbers that when Nate Diaz fights, everybody tunes in. But on the other side of it, this is the fight that Leon Edwards needs to become a household name. A lot of people don't know who Leon Edwards is, and that's a shame because this guy is ultra talented. He's on a sick win streak, technically nine fights unbeaten, eight fight win streak with the one no contest with Bilal Muhammad. But this is the fight that can put him over the edge and get him to being a household name where people will tune in to watch him fight for the title because if he wins, that is where he's headed. Yeah, yeah, that's so true, right? I mean, it, it, it's a, just a huge fight, huge opportunity for Leon. And again, like Bilal, I know you, you should have got that fight, buddy. You deserved every bit to be able to be put back in there, but he looks like he's getting matched up with a, a huge fight, a, a rumored as well. I'm not sure if that's official yet, but uh, – he seems to be on his way, and and Leon gets what he wants. He gets this this big money fight, attention fight, a fight that's going to prove to the brass, prove to Dana White. Listen, I am marketable. My skills speak for themselves. Put me in there with these guys, and I'll show you that I deserve these title shots and these big, you know, main event spots. These crazy co-main five round fights. And uh, for Nate, I mean, it's Nate. Put him back in that octagon. Give him a microphone, and you're going to sell a show. Another fight that has been brought up recently that is uh, a rubber match is obviously Dustin and Diamond Poirier and Conor McGregor will be going at it again. The rubber match, the drama. And, uh, you know, obviously we're already hearing from Conor's camp. We're hearing from Conor himself that there will be no more Mr. Nice Guy, that he will go out there and he will be the Conor of old. How important is that for him to be able to go out there and change the outcome of that last fight against Dustin? Well, Connor has to find the balance because the Connor we saw that was spit and venom. You know, let's, let's just talk about his losses. Let me rewind a little bit. He played the nice guy card, and I think it was very genuine against Dustin Poirier. Right. Comes up short. And then, you know, you go back to the Habib fight, really, uh, you know, spit and venom, polar opposite of who he was in, in the rematch versus Dustin Poirier. And he came up short in that fight. I think he's got to go back to the middle ground. He's got to be in the middle of that. He, there's nothing wrong with being a sportsman, but being the brash guy that made you become the champ champ. I think he's got to go back to the middle ground between those two things. I think that when, when Connor's at his best, when he's when he's using that sharp tongue and that quick wit that he has to, to sell these fights and talk some trash, I think that's great. I think that that's when he's performed its best. It's when he gets a little over the top like he did against Habib. That, that that can be a hindrance to him. And and it, it's it's all but up to the fighter, what goes on between their ears as to if talking trash and letting their emotions get involved, whether it helps them or not. It's not up to the pundits and the people on the outside to say that's what's right or wrong because ultimately it's the guy that's doing the talking. It's the guy that is presenting himself. It's up to him. So I think that – I think if he can get back to the middle ground between those two personas, I think that that's where he will perform his best. Yeah. Yeah, it's mental. It's, it's mental in whatever state it's going to put you in. What do you need to do mentally before you get into that octagon and, and perform at your best? And I'm not saying Connor needs to just immediately flip the coin and now just go be an, an a-hole, right? I think what Connor needs to do is be himself, but put an edge on it, right? Even because obviously he's got respect for Dustin. He doesn't seem to hate the guy. That seemed genuine to me in, in that last fight. But what I think he needs to do is to be able to take that and still put some sting on it, find something about him that he doesn't like, and now he's got fuel for that, right? Now he's been, you know, put out by this guy. He's been beaten 
on, on his big comeback, right? This was supposed to be the start of his season. So I think now he's got to mix that also with training camp differences. Let John Cavanaugh take the reins here, which he's good at. He's a great head coach. He's got great coaches around him, good striking coaches, good jujitsu guys. I went to that gym when I was in Dublin. It's, it's beautiful, and it's only gotten better since then. You don't need to go away to some crazy thing. Set some time with the right partners that are going to push you to the limit and not be, you know, hurting you or anything like that. But you need to let somebody else be in control of your day. Just wake up and be a fighter again. Yeah, essentially, Paul, we're this is like a real life Rocky three story playing out right in front of our eyes. I mean, Crazy. He, he built he built the octagon in his house and, you know, he had all the partners in his house and he's pulling up the fight week at the yacht. And I'm sure that he trained very hard for that fight. But there's a big difference between, like you said, a having somebody have the reins on your training camp where somebody is dictating the training times and what you're doing in the day um, when, when it comes to the training camp. I think that it's important that he does that. But I also think go back to SBG in Ireland, get back to those gritty, dirty mats and get to that, 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 that just that surrounding that environment. They mm -hmm. got you to where you were. I think that that's where he finds his most success. Not only does he need to get back to his old self being sharp, you know, sharp tongued and quick witted and, kind of making like you said making these fights edgy but go yeah. back to the same environment that got you there i think that that i think you put the those things together i think we see a different conor mcgregor that'll be an exciting fight in july and another big thing that got announced moving on since we last spoke ultimate fighter 29 coming Ryan back Edgar versus alexander volkanovsky things could have played out any better for this like look it's it's a shame that volkanovsky got COVID and his fight got bounced from the pay-per-view but, you know, he's doing better, and we're all glad to hear that. But this played out great for this next season, Ultimate Fighter, essentially. They, we, these guys are going to fight for the title. Ortega's a household name. Volkanovski's a stud. I think these guys are going to be great coaches. They come from great camps. What are your thoughts about it, Paul? Yeah, I like it, and I agree. You know, when you got a fight, fall off, you get sick with COVID, and things just – everything seems to be going wrong then you get an opportunity like this the ultimate fighter has been gone for a while it's coming back and you know it's going to be pushed to to a degree in this whenever you're coming back and you're trying to bring this show back it's a huge opportunity for the coaches that are going to be a part of it and volkanovsky is a champion that's kind of flown under the radar a little bit i think this could really be his coming out party um go out there really show his personality even more than he ever has had the chance. And Brian Tega is somebody that we've all fallen in love with as UFC fans and gotten to see him make his comeback after injuries and losing that title fight to Max. So this is just a humongous opportunity for both of these guys to take the reins and, and put on a show um, and then get to fight each other afterwards. So I, I, it's a great chance for these guys. I love it. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think that we're going to see some great guys being brought in and as coaches, you know, behind yeah. Alexander Volkanovsky, we'll have Eugene Behrman. We're going to probably see Israel Adesanya. We're going to see some of those city kickboxing boys. And those guys are going to be great, great assets for these fighters to learn from. And then on the other side with Ortega, you know, he's going to have uh, he's going to have Henry Gracie there and, and his whole team of guys. So good coaches with – there will be good energy. There will be good yeah. – I'm sure they'll dip at each other a little bit. But I think what's most important for the ultimate fighter is the contestants and what they get to learn – throughout the season, getting to learn from coaches and getting exposed to this, this big stage environment that I always call the ultimate fighter. This is, this is like college for the UFC. You learn about the interviews, the cameras, and, and just what comes with being a UFC fighter. So I think it's going to be great. And I think for Alexander Volkanovsky, it's important to get out from underneath the, the Max Holloway umbrella. I think that that's kind of what's held him back from breaking out. This guy's so dominant. Yeah. And like you said, he's flown under the radar, but that's because He's essentially, even though he's beat Max Holloway twice, he's just flying underneath him a little bit. So this is his opportunity to pull above him, fight Brian Ortega, and uh, you know start to continue this featherweight run that doesn't involve Max Holloway. Right. That's all true, and that's all very, very well said, Michael. But speaking of the ultimate fighter, in which you were a winner of season 15, right? I, uh, I John, John Anik doesn't like to call it season 15. He likes to call it tough live, the live part. Tough live, the tough, tough live. live. That's true. Tough you guys live. had a totally different experience. But that being yeah. said, there were some characters on that season, and I imagine there had to be some embarrassing or ridiculous stories that you can uh, share with us real quick here. <laughs> There's one that comes to mind just right off the top of my head, and it's uh, it's not an embarrassing one, but it's just a crazy one. Uh, me and my boy Raging Ally Quinta, we uh, – on our day off, we got one day off a week, and uh, 
we tapped into a bottle of Bacardi and uh, started to get loose a little bit. And we, we flipped the script on the cameraman. We, we, we made like a, a fake camera with like a, like a milk jug. And then we took like a, a pool cue and put a sock on the end. And so it was like a boom mic. And we were just like getting in their faces, like, come on, how do you feel? How do you feel about your fight coming up? How do you feel? Like sticking the boom mic in their face. And then, uh, uh al <laughs> well we and keep in mind we both got fined for this we got in trouble there are fines on the ultimate fighter if you take it over the top you're getting dinged 250 bucks and uh <laughs> al is like he i forget what happened but he turned and jumped in the pool and he had his microphone on and when he hit the water the guy that that is operating the microphones it just like sounded like a gunshot in his ear he, like threw his mm. freaking headphones off but yeah we both got fined for that but that was a uh, that was a fun one. It's actually there's a clip of it in the bloopers. Uh, I'll send you the YouTube link later so you can check it out. It's pretty fun. Oh man, I, I you know if you're going to tell a story from that season, thank God it was with uh, Rage and Al. If you guys are going to rage out, get into Picardy and start going at the the poor film crew that's involved in that show. I'm, we're sorry for you guys, but you know, uh, moving on and, and big things that have happened since the last time that we we're on this show and talking. Kevin Holland is back. Are we surprised? No. I'm not surprised. The second that I learned that Darren Till had suffered an injury, uh, probably most of our minds went to, well, I'm sure Kevin Holland would like to get back in there. <laughs> so what do you think about that? And uh, more importantly, what what does he have to do this time, Michael, that he was not able to really capture in that Derek Brunson fight? Well, first and foremost, I want to give a shout out to Darren Till. And I hope he's recovering well. I know he's devastated. He put in a great camp. And everybody loves to see Darren Till fight. But I instantly knew when he fell out of the fight with the injury, I just knew it's going to be Holland. I mean, he didn't take any damage. You know, he just – it was more of a grappling-based fight that he came up short in. And I think the key for him this fight, Paul, is you've got to put Big Mouth to rest. You, you, you have to put him to rest. And I think he said it best. He's got to get back to trailblazing Kevin. He's got to get back to the fighter, not the talker. And I think that this falls in line with what we talked about with the balance between being a sportsman and being a showman that Derek Brunson fight, he was way too much of a showman talking to Habib doing all this stuff. Like those antics are great when you win, but when you lose, it's really kind of a puts an extra little black eye on that loss, you know? And I think that in, in this fight, not only does he have to do it to give him his best shot to win, but you're fighting Marvin Vittori. This guy is so dangerous. He's going to be in your face. He's gonna be throwing heavy punches and you better be clinching down on that mouthpiece because if that left hand connects and you're Jack John, you're going to get – it could be problematic. So uh, I think it's important that he, he's got to get back to being more of a sportsman than a showman. And you're going to have to do it when you're fighting a guy like Marvin Vittori. This guy's no joke. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, uh, w one thing I do like about it is he, this is his fifth short notice fight technically in the UFC. And he's one of those guys that kind of surprises you when he's given these – big, tall tasks like this, right? Uh, I, I think the less pressure that Kevin Holland has on him, the better that we see him perform. It just there's certain guys like that, right? The longer the training camp, the bigger the main event. They've got to think about it, think about it. He's already been there now. Now he's been in the main event. He's gone the five rounds. Things didn't go his way. Maybe he got carried away with some of his, some of his antics. But now he gets a fresh, clean start against another absolute stud in this division that can put him right back in to the picture in the middleweight division for that belt. So this is a big opportunity for Kevin Hahn, and I agree. I hope he goes out there, and I, I hope he stays himself. I'm not saying that this guy needs to change who he is and how he fights, but you got to fight too, Kevin. You got to remember when you're on your back, just because you're down there, you, you got to fight and not just talk. So, again, this is coming from somebody who's been a fan of his, who's caught a lot of his fights and got to see this young guy grow in front of my eyes as a martial artist. So, Hope he's able to pull those things out and have a great performance. Yeah, I agree. Definitely stay stay true to yourself, but yeah. you've got to find the balance, man. This show is all about balance. This is what we're talking about. We're just talking about balances of, of personalities, you know, balances of personas. Um, you know, and, and it's a very big opportunity for Kevin Holland, but more importantly, it keeps Marvin Vittori in the dance. It keeps mm -hmm. him in it keeps him in, in, in this main event spot. Keep him and, busy. You know, this is a guy that Going back to his fight with Israel Adesanya, I mean, a lot of people argued that Marvin Vittori won that fight. He has been like a buzzsaw ever since. He's burning through guys in this division. He's ultra dangerous. He's very brash. He's from the motherland. He's from Italy. My boy Marvin Vittori. But I'm just glad he gets to stay in this in this in this main event because it, this is a guy that he's on the brink of getting a rematch with Israel Adesanya. I mean, it's a rat race at 185 pounds. 
And it would be a shame if, if him losing Darren Till as a dance partner, it would be a shame if it, it dropped him out of the main event and they had to go a different direction. So I think it's important that it keeps Marvin Vittori in this fight. Yeah. Yeah, big, big fight for him, right? Any fight for a guy like Vittori uh, would be big right now. Just because of all those things you said, it's still a big main event. And with everybody trying to race to see who is going to be the next guy to face Izzy, it's the only thing that makes any sense for him to stay in this fight and fight anybody. Um, huge opportunity for him. So I'm glad that he's staying in that event. And man, this guy is obsessed with winning that belt. Of the guys at 185 pounds, I really feel like he sits and thinks about becoming champion more than anybody in this division. Oh, 100. percent I mean, he's dwelling on it. He's he trains at a high caliber camp, and he, when you're part of camps for guys that go on to fight for the title and do things, it's motivating. You know, he, yeah. he's his main training partner is Kelvin Gastelum, and Kelvin Gastelum was a round away from becoming middleweight champion. So I think that. Not only has he had the drive to be a champion, but when you're exposed to people that have gotten to the goal that you're gotten to the goal that you're striving to achieve, I think that that's extra motivation. And look, we could talk about this main event all day long, but this card is stacked from top to bottom. But let's talk about some fights to watch that are beneath the main event. One fight I'm really looking forward to. I'm really looking forward to Sadiq Yusuf versus Arnold Allen. Two bright prospects. He got. You know, Sadiq Yusuf, one of the, you know, one of the superstars coming out of Dana White Contender Series season one. And, you know, his fight with Mike Davis was was so sick. And, and now he's moved on to have this great career in the UFC. And then he got a great fighter in Arnold Allen, who seven or eight by win streak in the UFC. And it, he's not a, much of a household name then. You would think with, with that type of win streak, people would know who he is. And I love when you put these prospects against each other. You hate to see one of them lose, but... It's going to be great to see which guy moves on to the upper echelon of this division and gets to fight some of the guys at the top of the heap. So I'm really looking forward to this fight. And I'm curious, what, what fight are you looking forward to, Paul? Yeah, I, I love that matchup. Uh, I, I really think that's one to, to keep an eye out for who's going to potentially become the next 145-pound contender. Uh, for me, it's just it's a person that I want people to look out for, and that's Jack Shore. He's an undefeated Welshman who's really just showing the world that the – the, the the arms of MMA have reached over to Europe for a long enough time now where these guys are becoming extremely well-rounded. It's not just kickboxers and strikers coming out of Europe anymore. We're really seeing guys that can grapple, wrestle more importantly, good ground and pound, and just coming from a sturdy, steady gym of fighters there in, in Wales. And people are kind of flocking to Jack Shore and his father and his team over there. So that's just a guy I wanted to give uh, a big shout out. It's somebody to look forward to. Yeah, there's a bunch of other great fights on the card. And one thing I love about it, it's on ABC. It's in the afternoon. I love afternoon fights. I'm sure the people on the East Coast love it too. But one thing that's going to be debuting this fight night is the new Venom deal. The new oh, yeah. the new fight kits. I'm super stoked on them. I've had a chance to see them firsthand. Look at the guns. Look at you can't see in the light, but dude, the guns, the guns I'm showing at that photo shoot, Paul. I mean, you oh, just get a load of those puppies. I mean, dude, not only did I get a debut of the gear, but they made my my biceps look freaky. They grew them. That that's the technology that they're working with these days. That they actually were, you know, they they added somebody else's biceps onto your body. That's right. impressive. Awesome. All right, let's do the roundups here. The the last the. Uh, the five rounds here. What's round one, Michael? What's round one? Round one is Whitaker Gastelum. Let's talk middleweight madness. Let's talk Whitaker Gastelum, a fight that was supposed to happen at UFC 234 in Melbourne, Australia. These guys coached the Ultimate Fighter. Super excited for this matchup. What are your thoughts about it, Paul? I think it's a great fight, and it's just great to see Rob Whitaker getting in there, staying busy. And for Gaslam, this is an opportunity to get that fight back. There was some controversy between these two guys. It didn't go down before, and um, now we get to see them throw down. And it couldn't be a better time for the middleweights to be in these kind of matchups, right, to be in these main event positions because – we're all waiting to see who is going to be next for Israel Adesanya, and these guys get to throw their name into that hat. Yeah, and essentially it's that March Madness middleweight tournament we were talking about before just starting to play out. But I'm just excited to see these guys finally fight. I mean, it's a shame when you see, you know, this this was supposed to be a main event headliner for the title, and, you know, uh, Whitaker had to pull out. He had that, what was it, tear in his abdomen, some freak injury mm -hmm. that only a crazy guy like Robert Whitaker would get. But – 
I'm super excited that we get to see this fight play out because Styles make yeah. fights. I think this fight's going to be super exciting, and we're definitely going to see a guy move on to challenge for the title from here. I think that Rob Whitaker wins this fight. I think he very well earns his right to be the next guy to fight for the title. And for Gaslam, I mean, he can go out there and steal his spot. So I think it's great that we're finally going to see this fight happen. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, we kind of maybe threw Whitaker away a little bit um, the last time we were talking about this. So you're right to kind of put – some shine on his name that this guy's been there done that if he wins that fight he really could be the next in line but round two uh gilbert burns and wonder boy have been rumored to be matched up potentially in july that's obviously the nicest matchup of nice men that we've had in a while especially in wonder boy who doesn't say a bad thing about anybody speaking of nice matchups let's talk about some mean people matchups and guys that haven't been so nice to each other what what fights stand out to you throughout ufc history that are just and those are two mean, angry dudes towards each other. Just off the top of my head, you got to say Michael Bisping versus Jorge Rivera. I mean, yeah. Jorge Rivera's making these crazy videos leading up to their fight, talking a lot of trash, take, taking some pretty low digs at Michael Bisping. And you know Michael doesn't take kindly to things like that. He's already yeah. a guy that wants to talk some trash and, and do things of that sort. He's already a chippy guy. And, I mean, some ugly things played out in that fight. I'm pretty sure Michael landed an illegal knee. Uh, I'm pretty sure he spit um, – on or at Jorge Rivera's corner. So, I mean, that fight was just like, that fight was a little over the top in terms of a mean matchup. But uh, what's yours, Paul? Yeah, I mean, I got two that I want to bring up. Obviously, John Jones, Cormier won when, you know, they're shoving matches. People are getting flown all over stages. That, that, that was true bad blood, right? You can tell when things are kind of put on, but uh, uh, that one is just uh, bad. That one stands out. And uh, Conor McGregor and Jose Aldo would be my second one. Yeah, you got to give a little shout-out to the Philly boy, Dave Schaller. Dave Schaller just yeah. in the middle of those guys in the press conference. <laughs> it's important. Now, i got to ask you, Paul, and I know I'm sure you're excited to hear my response to this, but we're getting a lot of movement at welterweight. You know, we're getting Burns yeah. and Wonderboy. Kamara's fighting Jorge Masvidal. But that leaves one of the guys in the top five without a dance partner, Colby Covington. What are your mm. thoughts on that? Uh, what would Colby do right now, Paul? Man, you know, we're talking about a guy in the mix that has been kind of quiet for a little bit and on the sidelines. And I know there's this guy, Michael Chiesa, who's in the 170-pound rankings that is just chomping at the bit. And I know he's got a, a promo ready to rip right now. So, Mike, I'm just going to toss it right back at you and let you sell this fight, bro. Colby Covington, you cannot say you're the best in the world if you haven't even proven you're the best welterweight in the Northwest. Oregon versus Washington. I've called you out twice. I know you know who I am. Pick up the phone. Let's fight in July. Quit ducking me. You can't say you're the best in the world when you're not even the best in the Northwest. I run this area of the U.S. So if you want a shot at, at the world title, you got to settle who's the best in the Northwest. Come fight me, Colby. The ball's in your court. You're not going to sit and get a title fight. You're not going to sit and get rewarded for doing nothing. You have to fight somebody. You might as well fight me. Yeah. Get out of here. Yes, I Yeah. I thought you were going to rip your sweatshirt off, Michael. Come on. Jeez, I'm disappointed. Hey, listen. I you're shooting your shot. That's a fight that you should want. That's a fight that you should get. Um, obviously, I'm your friend, and uh, I'm on here with you doing this because we're buddies. So I, I want that fight for you. Uh, I, I see no reason why that fight shouldn't happen. So let's get it done. Come on, UFC. Give this man a, an offer for the summer. He wants to fight in the summer. He wants to get back into training camp. Let's go. Yeah, come on, Colby. Let's let it rip, buddy. And look, I could, I could hammer on this guy all day long and you know yeah. try to – not a, I'm not a, I'm not a trash talker, but I'm a guy that likes to call my shot. Yeah, and you have fun. I like to have fun. You know, you could have fun with that one too. You know, you know, you could sell it. And yeah, uh, hell yeah, I'm all about that. Let's talk about your old stomping grounds, Paul. Yeah. Let's talk about CFFC. And let's talk about oh, my God. gruesome injuries in MMA. Let's talk about the finger. I mean, the guy. For the people that missed it, Paul Felder, my counterpart. This is a former. Yeah. CFFC lightweight champion. We've seen some great fighters come out of CFFC, but we've now seen one of the most gruesome injuries in MMA history. When the fighter yeah. lost his ring finger, Paul, tell me yeah. about it. I mean, you got the details on it. You were actually there, weren't you? So I wasn't there. I was there the following night. I went and, and stopped and saw some fights there. Uh, but the night before, I was at home watching it. And I was watching that and watching a movie. So I had the, the, the fights on silent while I was watching the movie. So I kind of dozed off. 
uh, didn't see what happened. Then I'm going to bed and I'm checking on social media to see what happened with some of the fights that I missed. And I saw all this finger stuff and I got the lowdown from Rob Hadak, who's the president of CFFC, who's my former manager as well, and a good friend of mine. And he's like, that finger dislocated in the one round. And then throughout the course of the fight, when they're hand fighting and the guy kept grabbing the glove a lot, I guess it got pushed back and into the glove. So throughout the broadcast, CM Punk and everybody, they're talking about where is this finger at the entire time. It was snapped off and then lodged into his own MMA glove. So it wasn't until they got to the hospital, they could see that the finger was actually still there and they were able to successfully reattach it. So shout out to the doctors that took care of that young man on uh, Thursday night for CFFC. Yeah, look, that's Great. one of the craziest injuries we've seen in MMA, but let's talk craziest injuries we've seen in the UFC. First one that comes to my mind is when John Jones almost lost his big toe. And that, oh. when that one strikes home with me is that yeah. was from like a grappling exchange where he was like driving his foot on the canvas and, and it's almost lost his big toe. I just remember he's just like cool as a cucumber doing his post fight interview, and then they just dropped the camera down on his toe, and it was like, oh, my God. And you see him realize it. You see him realize it on camera. He's like, Oh, uh, I'm, I'm not so good anymore. Uh, and uh, for me, the one that it wasn't that long ago either, I, we got to talk about Joanna Jojacek and her the hematoma that formed on this poor girl's head that's just from punches and elbows. I mean, we've seen them pretty gruesome throughout the years, but that one where it kind of took over the entire portion of her forehead, that one stands out to me big time. Oh, and the drainage. I remember when she posted photos afterwards and that hematoma drained out into her face. And she had like, it looked, just looked like this bruise. It was just kind of like dripping down her face. Totally crazy. I don't want to talk injuries too long. I'm going to get squeamish. I'm, I'm going to lose my appetite because I'm hungry right now. Let's move on to we, round five. We have three African champions in the UFC now. We got Francis Ngannou. We got Kamar Usman. And we have drawing a blank here. Why am I? Ha- oh, Israel Asanya. Duh. Sorry. Uh, you know, we have three African champions. When do you think we could see UFC Africa? Because it's evident. It is long overdue. It, it's especially right now. It's like the, we got yeah. three champions and three weight classes. When do you think this happens? And do you think it happens, Paul? I, I, I like to think that it does. Um, because <laughs> especially you've got three champions. If these guys can retain these belts and become dominant champions on top of that, then at some point you've got to let one or two or God forbid all three of these guys headline an event. That would be just madness. And you could just market and sell the living crap out of that thing. But I think it's going to have to wait a little while because we're just now getting back into stadiums. We're going to Texas and Florida and hopefully some other places throughout the summer and early uh, into the fall. But I think in a year or two, depending on um, the state of the champions, and I think regardless, actually, champions, we've got to get over there. It's just a place we got to check off that bucket list. And I, I think that would be a cool place to go. Yeah, I think we were even talking about this. There's, there's always been clamor for UFC to go to Africa, even before we had these three great champions holding titles within the promotion. So I think that the time is now more than ever. But you know, just like you said, we got to wait till things clear up. I think 2022 at the earliest we could see UFC Africa. But yeah, it's it's just like the one place we haven't gone yet. We've been to every continent except for Antarctica and Africa, and I don't <laughs> see us going to fight in a in a you know with the penguins and some igloos. No, I I don't think <laughs> I don't think so. That's where all the secrets of the world are anyway, Michael. So we can't go there. The security will stop us. Um, but, hey, I want to do an honorary round six, Michael Chiesa. Um, and I want to pull up a picture right now. And I want your opinion on this young man and uh, what attributes does he have and why am I so intimidated by this guy? Well, you can just tell that that's 80 pounds of twisted steel right there, my friend. But, look, I don't know. I think it might be the skinny legs, might be the skinny arms. It's not the most intimidating-looking 12-year-old wrestler I've ever seen, but – I'll tell you what, that knee sleeve's not fooling anybody. The, the problem right there, Paul, is my stance is too narrow, and you can tell I'm looking for that right-handed head and arm. Didn't really have a versatile skill set back then. I'm over here calling for a fight with an All-American wrestler. You guys pull up this picture and do this to me. It's okay. Well, I will tell you this, Paul. From a coaching standpoint, if you're coaching that young man, you tell him, widen that stance a little bit, get a little bit lower, 
those legs look like they're very they're very easy to get in on and uh, probably pretty easy to take me down. So tell the, if you see that young man like that, tell him to widen his legs, get that stance a little bit lower. Well, Michael, the reason that I ask is because I actually have to film an audition tape for for a, an audition for a TV show where I would be playing a wrestling coach and the audition side is normally you get some sort of script and there's a scene that you'd film and have a reader, but there's no reader. This is just me coaching wrestling, yelling stuff. So what are some things like if I'm at a tournament or I'm doing, you know, I'm the head wrestling coach, what are some main things that I'm for sure yelling out during a match? Oh my God. There's a funny video out there of like the stuff that wrestling coaches say. Yeah. I was going to say, half 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 you always hear coaches yell half yeah that's like the most rudimentary basic effective pinning combination you always hear coaches yell for the half uh one thing you'll always hear me say because i coach wrestling is i always say move your hands move your feet you know guys will kind of get stuck in the mud and the more you move your hands move your feet the better it is to, for you to set up your takedown set up your fakes and things of that sort and uh but i'm telling you half you'll always hear half half and people don't know what half nelson is you're right. And you just came and watched a wrestling match. Like, why the hell is everybody yelling half? It makes no sense. Yeah. But run the half, baby. Just yell, run the half, run the run half. Run the half. All right. That's good. I may I'll hit you up separately with some other things uh, before I go ahead and make that. But anyway, moving on, let's wrap this baby up. Uh, great talking to you, Mike. Obviously, we've got some early fights coming up this weekend in uh, Vittori versus Holland. Uh, Holland obviously stepping back in on short notice. Is a G. He gets to redeem himself. Vittori gets to prove again that he's possibly one of the best middleweights in the world. And then will we be coming back and previewing uh, two, uh, 261 or uh, coming up in the next couple of weeks? So we got a lot to talk about. we got a lot of things to watch while we're away. We'll see you guys in two weeks. Michael, any closing thoughts, my man? No, I just can't believe you guys hit me with that round six. Just, you that's, that that <laughs> photo is epic, and I wish I hope we can just close with that photo potentially to wrap this show up. Again, this is UFC Roundup. We'll be back in two weeks. Thanks for joining us, guys. Me, Michael Chiesa, we're out. Thank you. Peace.